I think it's time to get started. Um, good evening and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Zhinan Chen. Uh, I used to work as a climate policy fellow at the California China Climate Institute, and I'll be the facilitator for today's discussion. Personally, I'm really excited about the upcoming discussions today because I traveled back to Shenzhen, China two months ago, and I was simply amazed by the number of new EV models on the road that I've never seen before. Um, and all the taxi drivers in Shenzhen I interacted were very enthusiastic to express their positive user experience of EVs after several years of usage. So I believe you are also very exciting to hear from our speakers. Before we get started, uh, I'd like to share a few housekeeping items. First, we are recording this event and it will be later available on CCCI's website. And second, this event is being simultaneously translated into Mandarin Chinese. Using the globe icon as a base of your screen, please select either the English or the Chinese channel for your preferred language. We have a Q&A session after the presentation and the commentary sessions. So if you would like to ask a question to one of our speakers during the Q&A portion of the event, please type your question into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer as many questions live as possible. To begin with, we'll start by hearing an overview of China's recent rapid growth in electric vehicle from Yun Shi Wang at UC Davis. Yun Shi is the director of the China Center for Energy and Transportation of the UC Davis Institute of Transportation Studies. And he is also the co-director of the US of the China US Dev Policy Lab. Over to you, Yun Shi. You, okay, thank you, Zunan. Let me find my slides. Um, okay, so uh, the topic is a, a glance at the Chinese new energy vehicle deployment in, the, in 2021. Uh, I'll do that, okay. So the left side is the overall total vehicle sales uh, in the last four years. As you can see, the growth is really a uh, very slow and the market is sh shrinking a little bit. And the right side is uh, the new energy vehicles. Definition of a new energy vehicle is that it includes battery electric vehicles plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and uh, fuel cell electric vehicles. So uh, the growth of the new energy vehicles was rapid last year, 157% up. Uh, it, it in line with our projections, we projected the China's total market will be slow, but with the government policies to increase the uh, new technology, uh, electric vehicle will grow rapidly. So in terms of market share, last year reached uh, around 13 to 15%, depending on different uh, sources. And it was quite rapid, as you can see. Uh, in previous years, about around 5%, 6.2%. Then last year went to 15.5%. Uh, uh, so, in this year, in 2022, it is expected to reach 20%. So that's three years ahead of the government target for the market share by 2025. Uh, in the first two years right now, the market penetration rate is for new energy vehicle that's including commercial vehicles is 17.9%. For new energy passenger vehicle, the penetration rate is already 20%. So it's very hopeful. And BYD chairman, uh, Mr. Huang, Huang Chuanfu predicts recently at the, the EV100 that the new energy vehicle penetration rate will reach 35% in 2022. So if we assume the market, the size is about 22, 23 million vehicles that 
35% will, will be eight to nine million vehicles. That's a huge number. So look at the segments you know, which in, in the passenger vehicles, what size of the vehicles are selling well? The encouraging sign is that for the smaller ones, the micro cars, what we call the AOO, uh, 99, almost 100% now are uh, electrified. So uh, the market size is quite substantial as well. It's 900,000 around, accounts for about 27% of total new energy uh, passenger vehicles, that's the whole year. Okay. Um, then you look at uh, uh, A size and B size, they all have quite big numbers as well. Uh, in the C and up, that includes, uh, uh, includes the Tesla Model, model uh, 3. So it's a, the market share is now 16.3%. And then you have the uh, SUVs, you have Model Y and we have Neo, other you know, vehicles, the town uh, do model, and they all account for quite a substantial uh, portion of the market. So we believe that China's uh, light duty vehicles will be fully electrified, let's say seven to 80% sooner than expected. The market is growing really rapidly. Now, for the micro cars, here is the big example of the most popular one called Wuling Hongguang Mini E. Uh, in the size of Mini Cooper, it's about 4,500 to 6,000 US dollar equivalent with a range of 120 kilometers. So it's quite good. And it's very popular in the second and third, even fourth tier cities, smaller cities as well. And Model 3 is about nine times to 10 times as expensive as, as Wuling Hongguang. So here is the, the price difference. And look at uh, uh, the markets. You can see that traditionally the large markets, large cities with the uh, license place restrictions uh, accounts for a big portion of their share is in decrease, whereas the share of the smaller cities, the fourth tier cities has increased quite substantially. So this is also a very encouraging sign. That means it's not just the government policies, but the market, the, the, the market is, drive, is driving the shares forward. And we believe that second and the third tier cities uh, will increase even more. So looking at these tables, these tables I got the, the beginning of the year, so it's not totally complete, but uh, one thing we, we look at it is the uh, heavy duty trucks. Uh, the heavy duty trucks of the, the trucks that, that, is, that are 12 tons and above uh, is huge in China. It's one point, about 1.4 million trucks sold last year. Among them, only 0.8%. It's, it's that small number uh, are electrified. So among those numbers, about 30% now are battery swap trucks. These are the new business or technology models, right? Because they're cheaper to buy. You, you only buy a truck without batteries, and then you use the batteries later on. And, and instead of uh, staying in a, in a charging station for 30, minutes or one hours, you can swap the batteries for six minutes. So, so there is some advantage of that. Now, coming back to uh, Chairman Wang of BYD's uh, claim that, that by the end of next year, probably will be 35% because he look at these numbers. You can see for each month forward last year, there was about 1.5% increase in market share. So he believed that with that trend that all the way goes down to, to the December of this year, then probably we will reach something like 35% for the whole year. So we'll also, we can see that BEV technology improves steadily. Ranges are meeting, not exceeding consumer demands. So the ranges are increased as we can see here. 
if we don't count the, uh, the Hongguang Mini E, uh, they increase substantially. Uh, battery energy density is also increasing. And then battery, battery EV, BEV efficiencies are increasing as well, uh, improving very well. So these are good signs for, uh, for a competitive market. And then, then charging infrastructure have followed along as well. Although there are lags behind in third tier cities and small cities, uh, used to be about you have four vehicles, four BEVs, uh, for one charges. Right now, it comes to about three. Uh, last year, because of the rapid increase of the vehicles, so you, you stay at about three to one. I think the target probably somewhere between two to three, depending on user situation. Uh, another thing is, uh, is very encouraging is China's new energy vehicle right now alone is the fourth largest auto market in the world behind Japan, in ahead of India. So that indicating that the new energy vehicle has reached a scale for commercialization. So you look at this, you can see the number one, these are all light duty vehicles. Number one is China, number two, United States, number three, Japan, and then, then number four is China's new energy vehicles ahead of India and Germany and other countries. And if China reaches 20% of the market share, there will be about 4.5 to 5 million vehicles this year. That means Chinese new energy vehicles alone will be third largest auto market in the world, right behind the United States, substantial market. So the other thing is uh, the driving factor for China to decide to go the new energy vehicle route is to leapfrog the Western technology, Western dominance in the ICE vehicles, internal combustion vehicles. And I think the frog has leaped. If you look at last year's uh, exports, China's exports doubled last year to 2 million vehicles. So this is quite substantial as well, 2 million in numbers. And it's, in, it's still increasing as well. And new energy vehicles, this side is the new energy vehicles are growing faster three times as fast as traditional vehicles, as total vehicles, right? And here total export is one, increased by 100% and total new energy vehicles increased by 300%. And for the first two months, total export is continuing up by 75% and new energy vehicles again up by 381%. So with this trend probably will be four times as much as the total export by the end of the year. Another encouraging sign. So Chinese batteries, batteries made by Chinese companies also lead the world. As we all know, CATL right now has about 33% of the market. And then, then you have BYD here, mostly for its own use, but I think also for some other companies as well. Uh, so it's the number four, right? You know, in ranking. So there are some issues. Number one is 2025 new energy vehicle market target of 20% obviously is too low. We can reach it this year already. So we need more ambitious goals for the double credit policy. Because if your goal is just 20%, then the dual credit policy, the new uh, for 2024, file four and 2025 will have to sort of matching that goal. And then, you know, it will be the due credit won't be as stringent as we want, want it to be. And another thing I think you need a global coordination among major auto markets and producing vehicle producing countries, because obviously you need the same standards, similar standards. You, you, you share your ambitions, you encourage each other. Uh, that will be very important. Right now, China, Europe are leading. United States is sort of catching up, but from far behind. Japan is also so-so. So I think definitely if we want to move forward 
fast with the fast pace, we probably will need the four largest markets to, or producing countries to work together. Again, uh, heavy duty trucks progress in heavy duty trucks is much slower. They only up by 54% and we need to work on more. So at the global EV round table about two, year, two days ago, uh, hosted by EV100, I offered three suggestions to the Vice Minister Xin Guobing. So uh, Vice Minister Xin Guobing is here. Uh, very quickly, just one, we need high goals for 2025 uh, for companies to move forward because if, if the goal is too low, the, the companies don't know what they need to do. With the high goals, then we, meet, we will need more string due credit policies for 2024, 2025, and three, uh, the subsidies will be ended uh, 2019, uh, November, I wrote an op-ed in China uh, asking for the extension of subsidies for two years uh, because it was supposed to end in 2020. Uh, EV100 relayed my uh, proposal to the government and I, I obviously there are other uh, people, advisors also provide their advice as well. So the government in, in, at the beginning of 2020 decided to extend for two years. So it will be ended this year and we think that the subsidies for passenger vehicles should be ended now that we have a commercial market for it. But the focus should, should be really to concentrate our resources on heavy duty electric vehicles. It's the highest handing uh, fruit that we need to take it. Uh, in terms of future projections uh, at the EV100 two days ago or three days ago, Professor Ouyang Mingao's team predicts that the total um, new, en uh, new energy vehicle sales will continue to grow to about 40 million per year when, when China reached, reaches 100, near 100% 100 market share, and mostly in EVs. So this will make about six, uh, 600 million in stock. Uh, quite a substantial numbers. We have a little less uh, rosy uh, projections. So uh, about 13 years ago, we did a projection that projected China would grow rapidly, much faster than all the major forecasters. So the red dot line was our projection. The black line is, is the real line. So very, very close. Uh, right now, major forecasters have a trend that to overcompensate their, their underestimates in the past, and they projected all pretty high uh, to about six, 500 to 600 uh, million in total stocks. However, we project a little bit slower in a, in a, in a uh, higher case and much slower in the lower case following the Japanese uh, growth patterns in the last 20 years. Uh, in, when the Japanese growth pattern will probably just reach 230 to 240 per 1,000, that, that's quite slow. I think the real growth will be somewhere between. So that's uh, what we look at the Chinese population, obviously the rapid aging of Chinese population uh, reached, I think it peaked last year so probably, or uh, this year, so uh, we look at what happened to other countries when they grow, uh, they are aging old, uh, their population aged, uh, they are 65 and older population to reach 10% or 13% or 70%. These are the, all the countries they have. And we look at their, their GDP growth rate after they reach certain uh, benchmarks of the aging. And especially if you reach really old age, which is 23%, we project that China will reach that probably by 2030. So you look at that and you look at the vehicle population growth, they grow really slow. 
So that's, uh, that's our reference point. Uh, thank you very much. Please feel free to contact us for more information. Questions? Shall I stop the sharing? Uh, yes, Yunshu, thank you so much for your presentation. I think we can handle questions at the end. Um, but if the audience has any questions for Yunshu at this moment, feel free to type it in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Yunshu, thank you again for this amazing presentation. I think it's really comprehensive and informative, and I really like it that you touched on so many different aspects of the NEV market, including light duty vehicle, heavy duty vehicle, the vehicle and battery technical specifications, city level analysis, as well as your recommendation for the Ministry of Information Technology and Industry. Uh, so now we'll turn it over to some other experts in this field for comments and uh, uh, react and share their insights about these developments in China. First, we'll have Hui He, who is the China Regional Director for the International Council on Clean Transportation. Her areas of expertise are efficiency and emission regulations for light duty and heavy duty vehicles, as well as vehicle electrification policies in China. In addition, we also have Frank Jarado, a representative from the EV industry. He is the Senior Director of Communications at BYD North America. Uh, I'll turn it over to Hui first, and then Frank, if you don't mind, you can go after Hui. Great. Uh, thanks, Jinan, for the nice introduction, and thanks for CCTI's invitation. Um, first of all, can you hear me clearly? Great. Um, I would like to thank Yunshi for sharing the rich and latest data and observations from the Chinese EV market. I highly agree that China is moving beyond its expectation or the targets set uh, a few years ago. To use Yunshi's own words, the results in terms of year end EV market penetration reached 15% unexpectedly. So, why did this happen? Uh, with the next few minutes, I'd like to, I hope, to uh, extend beyond Yunshi's uh, nice work, uh, and of course to complement his nice work and to discuss what were the possible driving factors and how to maintain this trend in, in the years to come. I would like to highlight policies, especially. The exceptional growth of China's EV market, especially for electric car, a uh, passenger car market in the past year was a result of multiple policy stimulus. One, due to the economic downturn, the central government uh, decided to extend the central subsidy for purchasing new energy vehicles uh, for another two years. As Yunshi mentioned, from the original ending date of 2020 to 2022. Second, to further boost the consumer market, the key ministry, uh, the MIIT, launched, uh, or we can say relaunched, uh, the EV going to the countryside campaign. So this is a government-private partnership targeting EV sales in smaller cities where Western citizens, even including some town, towns and uh, rural areas in China. So in this policy, the various government agencies uh, formed a, like a special task force and they led the consumer campaign. And the participating manufacturers provide a short-term discount for purchasing new vehicles for, for the new consumers uh, during the period of the campaign, usually is two to three months. Uh, and uh, they also offer um, a, a, a test run of the consumers to, to further uh, introduce the models. Uh, and the participating vehicle models in this campaign were also targeting uh, the, the unique consumers in these smaller cities or less developed regions. They're not the, the Tesla models. They were more like uh, mid-sized or smaller sized and mini-sized models such as Wuling Hongguang. A third, but a very important policy factor is the new energy vehicle due credit policy. Yunshi also touched upon this, and this is actually a big credit to the, uh, to the California and China lab led by Yunshi. So this policy initiated in 2019, 
it requires vehicle manufacturers to gener uh, generate certain amount of credits by producing EVs. And this part works uh, almost like California's landmark uh, ZEV program. But with the due credit system or the, the due element, the policy also allows manufacturers to use their extra EV credits to offset their fuel economy credit deficit. This is a huge motivation for manufacturers that produce both types of vehicles because um, the 2020 and even the 2025 fuel economy targets for passenger cars in China were pretty tough to meet uh, by solely improving ICE technologies. It, it is uh, less expensive or more um, less costly to use electric vehicles to help with compliance. At the ICCT, uh, especially with help from your own Jinan Chen, we analyzed the impact of this due credit policy on the uh, electric car market in the past year. We found that the policy alone explains 10% explains of the EV market rate in the last year, 10% out of the 15% you just heard. Um, so with the extra fuel percentage points contributed from the other policies I just mentioned, the campaign and the others. And now we move to look at commercial vehicles and especially commercial trucks. Um, the key ministry in China, the same MIIT, is also developing a similar uh, new, new energy vehicle credit policy for commercial vehicles. Again, this is modeled after California's advanced clean truck rule. Uh, but before this rule um, kick in, right? It, it hasn't been finalized yet. If you track the market growth of electric trucks in China, not buses, the market began to take off only after 2018. So the ICCT also investigated into the possible driving factors. Uh, unlike the passenger cars, even the central subsidy was in the place uh, starting from, I think about 2010 for more than a decade. It didn't really play a key role in large scale of electric truck applications. Um, so only after 2018, in 2018, uh, the Chinese Ministry of Environment launched a three-year blue sky defense plan, which requires a significant air quality improvement in some 74 key polluted cities. Uh, so only then we began to see heavy electric trucks like uh, dump trucks for the construction industry, for, for the other heavy, dirty industry, and also tractor, uh, tractor trailers, tractor trucks emerge in a large scale application. And especially in those targeted high polluting uh, cities. To meet the blue sky requirements, these cities and regions actually adopted a variety of policy tools, such as requiring low emission zones, or road access only offered to ultra clean, including zero emission vehicles, and also only allowing ultra clean or new energy vehicles to, to, to drive, to operate on um, the high pollution days, uh, the, when you see the orange alert or the red alert, and only allowing these vehicles to operate in certain dirty industry. So these policies were very effective in driving up the initial electric truck market because these industries are usually uh, the large fleet owners. Talking about policies, the single most important climate policy in China in the last year was the release of China's carbon peaking roadmap uh, or action plan, sorry, sorry to use uh, the wrong word roadmap, it's an action plan. Uh, there were a few uh, provisions related to clean transportation and especially to uh, deployment targets of clean and new energy vehicles. But a major gap of that peaking action plan um, to China's long-term decarbonization goal is still immense. To meet the long-term goals, China will need to continue to um, consider more aggressive electrification targets. Uh, also, the ICCT recently published a study our analysis just suggests that the new cars need to be fully electric by 2035, and the electric share of medium heavy duty trucks 
need to be 40 to 75% by 2035. Uh, so on this point, I also uh, strongly echo Yunshi's statement that China really need to um, reconsider much higher goals for both cars and trucks in the following years. So without further ado, I conclude my comments and the mini discussion. Uh, I welcome your questions or thoughts. And thanks again for Yunshi's uh, sharing and for CCCI's invitation. Hi, I'm Frank Gerardo with uh, BYD um, Motors. And as you heard from uh, Yun Chui, uh, we are very active in the China market. And I wanna thank you uh, for, to the Institute and uh, for Hu Hui and uh, Yun Chui for uh, having this great opportunity to speak. I'm gonna turn this presentation around a little bit and talk about how the policies in China and the vehicles that are being developed there are affecting uh, us here in the United States in a positive way. Um, so, so as I mentioned, I'm with BYD. We have a factory in California where we build heavy duty electric vehicles, um, including buses and trucks. And um, California and other states in the United States are just now in really implementing policies that will drive electrification um, uh, in various ways for heavy duty vehicles uh, and for passenger vehicles. Um, so before I tell you that, I'll tell you a little bit about BYD. We started as a manu battery manufacturer in the 90s uh, in Shenzhen and um, quickly branched out into vehicles. And uh, we make, you know, new energy vehicles are, are I guess, uh, the highlight of what we do. And uh, in China, we have uh, cars and forklifts and heavy duty trucks and light duty trucks and, um, and buses. And here in the United States, primarily it's buses and trucks and forklifts. We see that um, that one of the things that, that we, we notice in our market is that data is a huge driver of adoption. Um, where, uh, for example, in the Antelope Valley, the uh, the local transit agency there uh, put 87 electric buses into its fleet, electrified the entire fleet, and um, as a result, they went from paying a dollar five a, a mile to operate from op to operate their buses, now they're, now they're getting a credit of 25 cents a mile for operating the electric buses as opposed to diesel. It's a huge way to, to show that adoption of uh, electrification, especially on the heavy duty vehicle side, uh, is important and, uh, and pays dividends to like a transit agency or um, in the ports. Uh, Hui mentioned the uh, advanced clean truck rule. And um, this is something that you know states, including California, are still grappling with because of how it affects, um, you know, the ports and the and the little operators and the people that, um, you know, aren't sure how the how even the infrastructure is going to be in place. So, again, though, we see where where electric vehicles are adopted at scale, uh, and the example I use here is at the Red Hook Terminal in um, Newark, New Jersey there's an appreciable difference uh, in the, the, uh, the cost of operating those vehicles uh, to the benefit of the owner or the operator and an appreciable uh, and in fact measurable um, amount of, or I, would, I should say reduced amount of carbon that's being released into the atmosphere. The more and more of these stories that we put together and, and gather and show that uh, you know, this is working, the more uh, the United States and California are going to not just uh, adopt electric vehicles, but um, adopt policies that are similar to what have, are being, uh, are playing out in China. So how will that affect sales? Well, um, the, starting with the federal government, billions of dollars have been made available to do things, everything from uh, putting transit buses in place in large cities to um, you know, almost $40 billion available to school districts to take their buses, um, their old diesel buses, in some cases 25 and 30 years old, off the road and replace them at virtually no charge with electric buses. So this is great because, you know, you talk about, um, for example, 
uh, environmental justice. Well, you know, the communities that are most impacted by dirty diesel buses are the ones that most need to have electric buses to, to um, you know, change the atmosphere in those, those impoverished neighborhoods. And, and the, the great thing about, about this is that as we adopt more and more of this and become more accepting of electrification with the school buses, for example, uh, the technology that uh, BYD has developed in China uh, is being brought over here to use these buses as a way to power the grid. You know, a school bus only operates for a couple hours a day. So, uh, you know, at, during that downtime, that giant battery pack, those hundreds of kilowatt hours can be, you know, put into the grid um, and, you know, in times of uh, um, trouble or emergency, you know, you can, you can power a hospital, you can power a school, you can power, um, you know, a block of homes or an emergency operations center. These are, these are so well, while there's a lot of data out there to show how, how things are being adopted, uh, the, the more data that shows positive um, outcomes, uh, the more we are going to begin to take those, that journey into electrification. Uh, BYD plays a pretty significant role in this. Um, we, you know, we, like I say, we manufacture the buses and trucks here in, um, in China, uh, which, which you saw from those great graphs, as more and more NEVs are being adopted, there will be an appetite for them here. And I imagine at some point, maybe in the next three or four years, we'll start bringing some of these models here to the United States. Um, and that you know, is, I think, where the rubber meets the road in all of this. We have this great data that, and these great um, facts that are coming out of China. And then we can show you know, to uh, consumers and government here in the United States that this is not only something that needs to be done, but something that can be done, and that there is a total solution for it. Um, and, uh, you know, we can all play a role in it. I think the final thing that I want to point out in this is that these, you know, it's not just the adoption of these technologies, but it's the fact that you have to, you know, build infrastructure and um, supply chains and manufacturing abilities. And one of the, the nice things I think that um, for example, a company like ours brings here is, is not just technology, but we bring jobs. We have 700 jobs in our, uh, in our factory in California. We expect to grow by, you know, multiple times. And, and those jobs are, you know, people who are making not just, you know, minimum wage, but enough of enough money to buy homes and buy cars and, uh, you know, contribute to society. And, um, that's, I think that's the beauty of a, of a, of a conference like this is we can see how at the end of the day all of this all of these pieces of these data points and um, and relative bits of information fit together and and bring the world together so i really again thank you so much ccci for the opportunity to uh, to talk to you on behalf of byd today i really appreciate it i'm happy to take any questions Thank you so much, Frank, for bringing in this very unique industry perspective. Uh, so now we would like to engage our audience in the discussion as well. Uh, as you can see in the chat box, if you have any question for any of our experts here, we invite you to type it into the Q&A box at the base of your screen. And we'll try to answer as many questions live as we can. Uh, I can see there are a few questions are coming in right now. Uh, while we're waiting for more people to finish typing their questions, I'm gonna take the advantage of being the moderator today and ask the first question, which might inspire more people uh, to bring challenging questions to our speakers. My first question is actually inspired by Frank, your presentation or comments before about how China can bring these lessons learned to California or to the US in general. Um, I think we heard today that China already reached 15.5% of NEV penetration rate. And I believe in California, this number was like 12.4% in 2021. And California is already leading all the other states in the US. So I guess Hui and Yunshi, if you have any comments on what are the lessons you, the U.S. can learn from China on this front, 
uh, we're curious to hear your thoughts. And Frank, if you want to add anything on this topic, feel free to chime in as well. Um, I think it, number one, I would say that California is doing quite well, but United States as a whole, uh, we don't have a consistent uh, zero emission vehicle policy. And, uh, President Biden says that by 2030, we would reach 50% uh, uh, in market share. So I look at it and say, okay, we have uh, last year, we have 2.9% in penetration. From 2.9% to 50%, that means each year you will have to increase in terms of uh, penetration is about 37% per year, right? So where is the plan between here and then? So this, this is my question. I think we've got to be serious. Otherwise, uh, you, you throw a number, we remember Obama had a number as well, right? And then, then we all forgot about it. So this is the number one, we need uh, some serious number. Although you know, it's, it's easy to say it's difficult to reach because of the you know, political division in the country. Um, this is the number one. Uh, in any case, we have to, uh, especially with the ZEV states, I think we probably can uh, have some more solid long-term plan, long and immediate term plan. And the second, I think, uh, I, I, I think probably we also need to be, have a policy that more friendly towards the new startup industries, not just in Silicon Valley, but <laughs> everywhere in the United States, especially for new manufacturing uh, companies. Uh, even in Silicon Valley, it's not too friendly towards manufacturing. It's hard to make stuff in the United States. Uh, I've been talking with the people living not too far from Silicon Valley, although not in the valley. I've been talking with people when they try to uh, start up something, especially to start up something that making things, they always source to China. <laughs> They're very hard these days. So you, you, you do have to have a good environment for uh, manufacturing. I think this is key. Uh, we got to be very friendly to those entrepreneurs who have uh, made a fortune, but through making things. For example, uh, Elon Musk, I would say. I recently wrote and uh, published an op-ed in defense of Elon Musk because uh, you know, he was the richest, fifth, among the richest 15 person, he was the only one who make something. He was an industrialist. So we need to be a little bit friendly towards uh, making stuff. Uh, I think this, this I mean, I'm just speaking broader. Well, uh, okay. Um, I I would still want to focus on the policies. I think basically, uh, first of all, I'm not an expert for the U.S., but from what uh, what I heard from my uh, U.S. team uh, colleagues, the U.S. basically missed several years the golden uh, time or opportunity to accelerate electric vehicles, especially in terms of um, this greenhouse gas regulation. U.S. used to be the lead. The ICC has a legend chart mm -hmm. showing the first tier of global markets who have most ambitious greenhouse gas emission standard for cars and trucks. The US was always in the first tier, but the US disappeared on that chart for a critical several years. Now it's back on track, but let's see how that policy will drive um, zero emission vehicles faster to, to enter the market. Um, but second thing also, I don't see as many model availability in the US as in, in China. I myself is shopping for electric car, but there are only a few deep decent options. <laughs> but, I mean, in China, in our database, there are thousands of um, vehicle models altogether for cars and trucks. But in the US database, I see it's much a shorter list. Uh, I'm not sure the impact, but I would assume that consumers are very diverse in the US and the cost parity points for different type of consumers for urban consumers uh, in advanced cities versus um, less advanced regions are very different. And uh, I, I think there needs to be more models to choose from. Uh, and then allow like the, the trial of innovative technologies um, such as battery swapping, give them a second chance. Uh, again, I'm not an expert on the US real world application, but 
from what I see in China, they really work for a certain commercial vehicle application and really reduce the cost both to the vehicles and to the charging or swapping network. So just a few quick comments. I think what we're seeing is a, in the US anyway, is a replay of the late seventies when um, you know, gas became uh, a shortage and, a, and, a, and an issue and um, American consumers were suddenly confronted with the fact that, the, you know, their car that got, you know, three miles to the gallon uh, was more, more costly in, um, than, a, than a Japanese car. But it took a long time for the, you know, the American consumer to adopt the Japanese car um, and, to, and, and adopt regulations that, you know, at that time were, uh, you know, restrictive on gas uh, technology. In fact, not California leads the nation in, in that regard. I mean, some other states still have very few, you know, smog restrictions um, or even, you know, some don't even, I think, have you put a catalytic converter on the car. So there's a, you know, there's this huge gap between, you know, states where this is recognized and states that have yet to adopt policies. Um, and you can see, you know, you can really see that gap, in a, um, you know, the difference between California and the American South, but you can see that gap between the, in New York and New Jersey. You know, New Jersey has developed, has uh, adopted several uh, clean vehicle regulations um, that are, you know, advancing uh, their communities in many, many different ways. And, and yet New York has yet to really get serious about it. I think that that is the the key phrase, get serious. And um, hopefully, you know, as more, and the way, I think the way it's going to happen is this, there's more and more money available to the, you know, the, the operators and, the, and, the, and as more and more people see that adopting this isn't a costly thing, it's a, it's a cost savings thing, that, that that curve will begin to mirror the curve that we saw in the data related to China. Yeah, I just want to echo Hui that uh, we also really need a uh, model diversity. Uh, Tesla cars account for about 70% of total US market last year and about 50% in California. So, uh, <laughs> you know, I guess customers will have need a different cars, you know, maybe dual model, dual mode cars, right, from DYD as well in future, I think. Hang in there, we'll bring them over soon. Okay, thanks. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for your answers. Uh, I know some of our speakers touched on battery swapping while answering this previous question. I think I was just reading the questions from our audience and there are two questions on battery swapping in particular. So I think we can answer them together. The first one is that uh, the audience that battery swapping for trucks were, pre were briefly mentioned. Are there any swap battery swap passenger vehicles as well? And if so, how popular are they? So this is the first question from an audience. And the other one was talking about range anxiety and how NEO's battery swapping practice can potentially solve this problem. So this audience asked, he's wondering if it's possible for all manufacturers to unify battery specifications and produce the same standard battery so that everyone can swap batteries no matter what brand or model they drive. I think these are interesting questions that can be grouped together. So really curious to hear your thoughts on that. Okay, so uh, in passenger cars, Neo is, is the leader. I think there are also Jelly, uh, uh, no, Jelly, uh, yeah, Cherry, Cherry, Jelly is uh, also ha having a model as well, but Neo dominates the market in passenger vehicles. Uh, in California, also, there is a company called Ample that provides some uh, stations in the Bay Area for people to uh, swap, they, but you have to change your cars a little bit. Uh, NEO's models, uh, they, they have uh, built, I think, over 1,000, maybe even more uh, swap stations across the country. So I, I guess uh, they're quite... A, Many people, I talked with the new people, they said all their models are battery swappable. I don't know whether people, all of them use it or not, but that's what's happening. And hopefully they, they will expand uh, to, the, to the other markets as well. 
Uh, in terms of whether we can ask other car companies to follow the suit to have a standardized battery swaps seems quite difficult. A few years ago, we had a better place uh, in California and it didn't work out. I did some study, you know, brief studies. Uh, my impression is that car companies don't want really standardized their batteries because thinking about flashlights, right? You don't want a BMW flashlights you know, still round, and you don't want a you know, Mercedes or something the same shape. So they want to have the flexibility of, of their, for their designs. They, you know, they don't want the same thing. Another thing is um, uh, liability in the United States might be even more an issue. Uh, if you have an uh, accident car you know, catch fire, whether it's, a, it's the swapping process that caused the fire, whether the owner didn't clean the car well that caused the fire, the, the, the connections between the swapping, or whether it's the battery issues, all these things that seems to be very difficult to be accountable. If you can't be accountable, you can't be insured. And then if you can't have insurance, then you can't have business here. Uh, so I think it will maybe possible, but might be difficult to have a universal uh, swappable battery. Uh, situation. You don't swap your battery in your phone. Why would you swap it in your car? That, uh, I just think that uh, we're looking at this wrong. Battery technology is growing in terms of energy density uh, and ability to, to more quickly charge batteries. Uh, I mean, how, how many miles can you drive in a day? Uh, how um, you know, how far do you really want to go? And I think many, many models of electric vehicles are very close to, you know, being able to say, listen, we can do 500 miles on a charge and you can charge this, you can charge this battery in three hours. And, we'll, and many, many others are saying, including us in our heavy duty vehicles, that we'll guarantee the, this battery uh, for, for 12 years. I think battery swapping is a way to, um, uh, you know, cheapen the technology instead of uh, look at it as being something that's functionally completely different um, from from what's from what's available now, and um, I think it's it's I mean it's great that people are doing it and they're being innovative and stuff, but I think there's the the real innovation is going to come in and uh, the density of the batteries and the ability to charge them quickly, and and that's that's what will benefit the consumer and the and the environment as well. Yeah, I, I would also like to, what great, great talks, um, Yun Shi and Frank. I would like to offer some data points because I just did some research on this. Actually, there are more battery swapping cars than way more cars than trucks sold in China in the last year. And we see is actually a burgeoning market. It's a booming market. Uh, just the, in the last two years because of several factors. But first I give you some data. So the number of battery swapping EV models grew by 10 times from 2020 to 2021. And in terms of market, uh, what, from about 20 models to 200 models, that's the model number. And then the sales of uh, battery swapping EVs in 2021 were about 105,000, uh, more than five, five times more than the number in 2020. The majority of them goes to passenger cars and uh, as you said, the neon as a car manufacturer is the leader. Um, now I turn to try to analyze several factors behind the scene. Um, we see the, the critical change from this wave compared with a better, ooh, better place, forgot, forgot the name even, is the leading, the leading player is a battery manufacturer. It's Ningde Era, C-A-T-L, representing 55% of passenger car market in China and probably a large share also globally. So when manufacturers once were wondering about standardization, if this thing is driven by a leading manufacturer, dominating, I'm sorry, battery manufacturer, this gives you additional insurance of success. I won't say absolute assurance, but it certainly increased the um, the, the odds. So the player is one thing. What CATL did is it went to um, 
it went, went to sign MOUs with multiple leading car manufacturers. Um, you know, I'm seeing like a BAIC, uh, Yutong, Dongfeng, uh, Shigong, Jili. These are like a truck manufacturers. I, I don't have the, the car manufacturers, uh, but just to give you a sense, uh, and it's already launching uh, two major pilot projects with in Fujian province in, in truck uh, swap, battery swapping trucks. So anyways, this large collaboration will give you more hope. Of course, the policies will also play a critical role. Um, as you heard that the subsidy for purchasing new energy vehicles were facing down, but it's not the case for battery swapping vehicles. The subsidies will go on for a while. Uh, and also in the last year, China released a, a plan or a pilot, a pilot program. It's like a 10 city, 1,000 vehicle version, uh, uh, 1,000 vehicle program for the battery swapping version. And it launched in, I believe, six, six cities uh, covering both passenger car and commercial vehicle markets. So the strong policy push combined with the leading uh, industry stakeholders are the successful factors so far yeah it's uh, 11 cities it's eight cities for both commercial and uh, oh yeah 11 cities yeah yeah for both commercial three, and three yeah three, three cities so i my uh my my sense is that most likely uh in commercial vehicles uh, there will be a some market for this passenger vehicles i think uh, probably will be <laughs> A niche market, maybe it's pretty tough, but we will see. We don't know. The technology is evolving so rapidly, so it's very hard to say. Thank you so much for these very comprehensive answers on battery swapping. Uh, I know we only have two minutes left, so probably we can only address one more question. And I would appreciate if like one of the three speakers would want to address this following question on heavy duty zero emission vehicles. So the audience is curious to know, is the focus in China solely on battery electric or there is a push for hydrogen fuel cell as a long-term solution as well? You should use it both. Yeah, you go first. Let, you should go first. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So uh, the, I think both are, the, the Chinese government look at both as a, as a, a sort of a part of the leapfrogging. I'm only looking at this angle as well, not only, but leapfrogging because uh, these are new technologies. The government feel like we have to understand them and try them. So hydrogen uh, is being uh, invested and in, tried quite substantially in China as well. China is, uh, I think, in terms of investment, in terms of energy uh, um, uh, spend on this is, is, uh, is, a, is a leading right now uh, in, in, in fuel cell electric vehicles. Batteries is still also very much focused as well. Uh, just said that the 11 cities are experimenting with uh, the swap technologies as, long as, as well as with the fixed battery uh, as well. So. Right, I can add a couple based on Yun Shi's wonderful answer. So yeah, China is actually looking at different technologies and hydrogen is a poster child recently. Just last week, China released a long-term hydrogen development plan and it targets 500,000 FCVs by, by what year, maybe 2035, I forgot the year, I need to double check. But that's the ambition. And you probably have heard at the end of last year, uh, the MIT also led this hydrogen fuel cell pilot city, uh, mm. including probably a dozen cities so far with that magnitude of goals I just mentioned. However, I am honestly, the SET uh, did some analysis. We were a little worried about the, the low carbon path for hydrogen, because if you look at it detailed of, of the policies, it doesn't really guarantee a low carbon pathway. And if you seek for really the green hydrogen pathway, it's not gonna be cost effective in the near term, not gonna beat the battery electric technology path. So anyways, um, it's, it's a, at a starting point, um, but China has huge ambition on it. I, I'm here in the US, you know, we're, we're neck and neck competing with the hydrogen fuel cells. Um, but, you know, Nikola, which offered a hydrogen fuel cell truck, 
announced today that they're going to battery electric. Um, I think that uh, I think we should be, you know, question the you know the efficacy and the efficiency of hydrogen, given that it's being supported by you know big oil and petroleum companies looking to stay relevant as you know vehicles become more and more electrified. Hmm. So thank you to all of our speakers, uh, and I apologize to these audience questions that we, we aren't able to address in this short period of time, but feel free to exchange offline and keep exploring this very important and interesting topic. Um, thanks again for each of our panelists and to our audience for joining us today. We really appreciate the time and participation in this discussion. Uh, just a heads up that this event is being recorded and will be later available on the California China Climate Institute's website for everyone to watch, as well as the YouTube channel. Uh, thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you in the next CCCI event.